morning. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see so many interested people coming to speak about these issues today. Um, thank you for joining us for this particular panel discussion. The past is always present, contextualizing U.S. state violence. We're joined by five exceptional academics, advocates, activists, and a multitude of other admirable titles. We have Professor Stephanie Smallwood, Professor Moon Ho Jung, Professor Scott Kurashige, <coughs> Professor Dan Berger, and Professor Alexis Harris. Collectively, they will help us to deconstruct and historicize the issues surrounding race, police brutality, and the American social and political landscapes that have long been tinged with violence, injustice, and inequality. We will then work to determine solutions that will help us to not only imagine, but then create a better world. My name is Terri Ann Scott. I teach African American history at the, in the Department of American Ethnic Studies here at the University of Washington, Seattle. What I will ask you to do is hold any questions and comments that you have until the end, and then I promise you will have an opportunity to share those. Um, so each of our panelists will first speak and then we will have that session at the end. First, we have Professor Stephanie Smallwood, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Washington, Seattle, and she will speak about the afterlife of slavery in the 21st century. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I'm, I'm really so heartened to see so many people here. Um, it, it really says something about the collective sense of urgency that we all feel. Um, and I think today is gonna to be a really rewarding day of collective learning and sharing and community building toward a vision for universal social justice in our time. But I think it's really important that we start by remembering what has brought us here today. Um, we're here because those who are pictured on these screens are not. This is a slide sequence um, that's going to run for about a minute. I'm going to let it run. Um, it shows just those killed in the year 2014. Um, so I'm going to let this run in, in silence um, because I think it's important for us to begin by just really acknowledging um, the deaths of these unarmed men, women, and children of color um, who were taken by the use of excessive lethal force um, by police or by those claiming to act um, under the auspices of the police. So we're here because of death, because of the awful and terrifying ease with which lethal force is directed against unarmed black men, women, and children in today's America, because of the frequency with which such killing of black Americans comes at the hands of law enforcement, because of the ease by which the killing of black Americans goes unpunished. As a history professor, um, I spend most of my time studying what we typically understand as a distant past, a time and place that we have left behind um, and in the past as we have progressed and moved forward in society. That past that I study is America in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries when racial slavery was legal and was part of the fabric of American society. And so what has really taken me aback as I've witnessed the killings of such African Americans as Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, and so many others, just in the past year, is how profoundly and clearly I see elements of that purportedly distant world that I study as a historian, not just reflected in our current moment, but actually alive and operating in contemporary U.S. society. Now, of course, I don't mean to suggest that the United States is still 
a slave society. Although I do think we could have a debate about that, but I'm not trying to claim that slavery is still actually being practiced um, today in the form that it was in the past. I'm not saying that, but I do mean to suggest that even after its abolition in 1865 as a legal institution, slavery had an afterlife and that it is this afterlife of slavery that we are witnessing and experiencing today. And the particular element of slavery's afterlife that I see with disturbing clarity in our world today is that part of the culture of American slavery that took it as a principle that because black slaves were chattel property, they could have no legal personality. In other words, black slaves could not be treated as people within the body of rules and regulations that govern society. This meant not only that, for instance, they could not accuse someone of a crime or could not testify in a court of law, it meant also that they could not be the victim of murder. To illustrate just what kinds of twisted legal pronouncements this principle could produce, I want to share with you what's on the screen here, which is the text of a law that was passed in Virginia in 1669. In the record books of the Virginia General Assembly, the law was shorthanded as an act about the casual killing of slaves. The text of the law first identifies the problem at hand, as understood from the perspective of the master class. The problem was how to punish slaves effectively. Right? And this was a problem because, number one, slaves couldn't be punished by having the time of their servile status extended. That was the practice with regard to English indentured servants. They did something bad, they were punished by having time added to the duration, the limited duration of their servitude. Well, you couldn't do that to punish a slave because by definition, slaves were already legally in servile status for the duration of their lifetime. From that came the second principle, that violence was necessary to discipline slaves. And that is basically what's being stated in this line here, that since whereas the only law enforced for the punishment of refractory servants resisting their master, mistress, or overseer cannot be inflicted upon Negroes, i.e. we can't add to the time of their service, nor the obstinacy of many of them by other than violent means be suppressed. So point number two, there it is. Violence is necessary and expected to discipline slaves. So the normal day-to-day -day violence of punishing slaves could result in their death. That is the context for this law. By the language of this law, it was firmly established that in such instances, the person who used lethal force to punish an enslaved black man, woman, or child could not be deemed guilty of felony murder. Why? Because it didn't make sense that one who owned a slave would kill their own property. In other words, that person could not be regarded as having held malice toward his own human property. Again, quite literally and explicitly, the black slave was property, could not be a person, could not be a subject toward whom malice was directed in the instance of death, of lethal force, of killing. This law is the first recorded example of a principle that is embedded in the culture of early America and of what then becomes the institution of slavery in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. The idea that not just violence, but more precisely lethal violence against black Americans is normal, and that such deadly violence cannot be categorized as murder or homicide. In other words, it established a principle that A, black life was expendable 
B, that the taking of black life could be treated as something entirely outside the boundaries of normative social relations, so much so that the taking of black life need not be questioned, need not be regarded as criminal and requiring that someone be held accountable. In other words, the notion that the taking of black life could be understood as so thoroughly and unquestionably justified that it need not come under the actual jurisdiction of the court in the first place. Black slaves understood perfectly well how much the twisted logic of slavery made their very humanity something that always had a question mark attached to it, was always subject to, um, was, was always questioned whether it really mattered, right? It's for this reason that one of the themes that percolates through the language of the slaves themselves is the very simple and poetic claim articulated in this statement that comes from an ex-slave named Tom Wyndham when he was interviewed in the 1930s. He explained that one of the things slaves often said was simply, us ain't hogs or horses, us is human flesh. Us is human flesh. It's a statement so simple, one that articulates something we might at first think is so obvious and self-evident, but it was an answer. It was a response to the principles embedded in the culture of America as a slave society, as evidenced in things like that 1669 law in Virginia. Slaves knew that it was the possibility of recognizing black humanity that was destroyed, disavowed, by the institution of slavery. And so they voiced this kind of response to laws like that one in 1669. That simple statement, us is human flesh. In the past several months, Black Lives Matter has entered into our lexicon as a statement demanding recognition of black humanity. Us as human flesh, black lives matter. They are the same refrain. They are statements that are striking, disturbing in their similarity. Why is it, how is it that it can be necessary to say in the 21st century the same thing that slaves said in the 19th century. It's this repetition in the 21st century of a claim coming out of the pre-Civil War 19th century that stops me dead in my tracks, that leads me to conclude that slavery's afterlife is reverberating in our world today. So I wanna close by suggesting that the legal abolition of slavery was only a beginning. It was the first and necessary step to create the conditions of possibility for what had been impossible in the United States before that time, and that is black freedom. Full realization of black freedom is an ongoing and as yet unfinished project. When slavery was abolished in 1865, it initiated a project to reconstruct, literally, American society such that black freedom, full black freedom, could become a reality. Now, as we know, as students of history, that project was aggressively and decisively derailed within a decade and a half, by the end of the 1870s. As a society, we did not return to the challenge of realizing black freedom directly until the mid-1960s, when the civil rights movement was aptly referred to by some as a second reconstruction. And so I want to close by suggesting that if we need to proclaim that black lives matter today, perhaps it means that the reconstruction of our former slave society is not yet finished. Perhaps we are in the time of a third reconstruction. Thank you very much.